William Blake's poems, The Lamb and the Tiger, are very nice just by themselves, but I think they're very interesting when you look at them together. And that's really how Blake would expect them to be examined anyway. Uh, these poems come from a collection that Blake published called Songs of Innocence and Experience. And so this came out in the 1700s. Uh, this came out right in the time period of the Industrial Revolution. And I think a lot of the ideas shown in the collection Songs of Innocence and Experience show uh, society basically advancing, but, but there being a cost. For this advance and this cost being kind of an innocence that's lost uh, that may be hard to get back. So basically the, the collection would be separated into two parts. You had the songs of innocence and the lamb would be a poem in that song of innocence. And most of these poems uh, would come from like a, a speaker who was a child speaker. Uh, and this would be, um, you know, uh, the, the poems would be lighthearted in tone or positive. They'd have a positive energy. Uh, they'd be hopeful. Uh, they'd be energetic. Um, and that would change quite a bit versus the songs of experience. And the song of experience would be the adult voice, not the child voice. And a lot of times the song of experience would explore the same kind of idea that uh, would come up in a song of innocence. But even though it was the same idea, the voice of experience, that voice of adulthood, uh, the post-fall voice, uh, the, uh, the pessimism and the darkness would really give a completely different dimension uh, of the idea. And for example, the lamb and the tiger both explore the idea, the idea of creation. And the lamb has a very positive uh, outlook on creation. And so we'll, we'll start with the lamb before we uh, challenge the ideas that surface in the lamb with what we see in the tiger. So I'll read this poem quickly. Uh, and you can even hear, I think, in the poetry, just the simplicity of it um, and, and also uh, the, the energy uh, in, in the poem is, is a positive energy that I think comes through in how it's written. Uh, this is the lamb. Little lamb, who made thee? Dost thou know who made thee? Gave thee life and bid thee feed by the stream and o'er the mead. Gave thee clothing of delight, softest clothing, woolly bright. Gave thee such a tender voice, making all the vales rejoice. Little lamb, who made thee? Dost thou know who made thee? Little lamb, I'll tell thee. Little lamb, I'll tell thee. He is called by thy name, for he calls himself a lamb. He is meek and he is mild. He became a little child. I a child and thou a lamb. We are called by his name. Little lamb, God bless thee. Little lamb, God bless thee. So although this is a simple poem, uh, there are some traits we should point out. Uh, this poem possesses some aspects of pastoral poetry, and pastoral poetry would be a, a simplistic form of poetry uh, concerning itself with like the countryside. Um, and we see this, of course, in some of the uh, the lamb imagery that we have here. Um, this would be the opposite of industrial poetry, and the imagery we get in the uh, the tiger is much different than this pastoral positive uh, country uh, natural imagery that we get in the lamb. Uh, there's no city here. Uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, this is looking at God's creation uh, that's untouched by man. And uh, uh, some other things to point out here: we have a little bit of repetition. But the repetition here seems to be a bit of a comforting repetition. You know, when we're children, repetition can soothe us. Uh, we have repetition in the tiger that we'll look at, but it's not soothing at all, uh, as I think it soothes here. Uh, we, of course, have Christ imagery in this, uh, which would, uh, you know, uh, have some some answers provided with the narrator's answer, which is a big uh, point to make here. We have two stanzas. The first stanza poses a question, and the second stanza actually answers that question. This is much different than when we get to the tiger. The tiger, we have stanzas where one poses a question, and uh, then the, uh, the other stanza just kind of uh, challenges the question. It doesn't answer it. It just kind of re repostulates uh, the question, and we'll look at that. Um, so if we look at the lamb here, considering that this is coming from a song of innocence and the childlike voice, uh, that we have of our speaker, 
of the poem and the imagery we have here that's very nice tender imagery we've got the christ presence um that's nice but i think when you pair the lamb with the tiger you get a lot more interesting dimension so let's look at the tiger and see how both of these are looking at a creator and the lamb has a very positive has a very comforting aspect of the creator of the lamb that basically there's unity uh, that he who created the lamb created humans uh, created everything and so there's this um there's an order. It's, uh, you know, this child voice that sees that it's not chaos, that there's order here, uh, that there's a unity in all things. And we don't have this, though, in our song of experience, which is the tiger. So let's read the tiger. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night. What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? In what distant, deeper skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet? What the hammer, what the chain, and what furnace was thy brain? What the anvil, what dread grasp dare its deadly terrors clasp? When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night, what immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? So looking at this poem, we've got a very different imagery set than we have in the lamb. Notice the imagery here is very destructive. We've got fire imagery. We've got war imagery. We've got kind of this machination imagery of, of chains, furnaces, hammers, anvils. And this fits with this idea of the Industrial Revolution. Um, you know, if you look at history, you see the Industrial Revolution, of course, had many, many positive things uh, that it helped produce, but also it came with a great cost. Um, you had in the Industrial Revolution, you had this flooding of people from the countryside. They fled the countryside and they moved into the cities because the cities were where production would happen. And that's where the jobs were. And so it's interesting in the land, we've got the pastoral countryside. Uh, here with the tiger, we don't see a city necessarily, but we do have a lot of uh, machinery, uh, man-made rather than natural images. Uh, you know, we've got uh, man-made weapons of war as well, such as the spears uh, that are raining down from heaven. Um, notice all the questions here. Uh, there are few answers. In fact, there are no answers we have, unlike in the Lamb. In the Lamb, our narrator gives us an answer for the original question uh, he asks. He tells us uh, who made the Lamb, right? Um, here, though, we have... In our first stanza, a question that's basically, who did it? And this question is never answered. When we get to our last stanza, a lot of students read it too fast, and they think it's just a copy-paste of the first stanza, but it's not. There's an important change. Could, in our first stanza, changes to dare in our last stanza. And this change makes the question, who did this, into why? did they do this? And think about how uh, terribly pessimistic and dark this chain of questioning goes, where we have our speaker here who begins thinking about who could have the power to make such a vicious killing machine like a, li uh, like a tiger, pardon. Uh, and then this question's not answered. This question after analysis that we have through all these stanzas and these other questions uh, just kind of snowball into each other that our narrator ultimately uh, isn't concerned with who is able to create the tiger. But the question becomes, why in the world would the the creator who created something like a lamb go the other end and make something as destructive and deadly as a tiger. And so I think this is really interesting, uh, you know, uh, the, the innocence of childhood, uh, you know, where I don't want to say that childhood that were, were simpler. I don't really think that's the case. It's just 
Uh, maybe we see things more clearly. Maybe we, we don't complicate things as uh, we tend to do so in adulthood. But whatever uh, the, the explanation for the differences in these two voices, it's important to notice that one voice we have is the song of innocence, and that gives us an answer. And we have here the song of experience, and you think that experience gives you answers. I mean, think about it. You think that the more experience you have, uh, the more you'll know. And that's not the case we have here. In fact, we find something that I find is very similar to higher education. A lot of people think, well, I'll go to college and I'll find out what the answers are. And then I think if your college is done correctly, that's not the case. You find that you just start to ask different questions like we have here. The question we have at the beginning, who did this, becomes why did they do this, which may be the more profound question to ask. Uh, even if we don't have an answer for that, it's interesting to look at. So I think these poems are important still today. I think a lot of uh, a lot of us may gut reaction be dismissive of poetry uh, that kind of shows the impact of the Industrial Revolution and uh, kind of this loss of innocence from a, a child versus this child turning into an adult. Uh, and, and they don't really see this as something that fits anymore. But, you know, it, it certainly does. I mean, if you look at our world and you look at the globalization that our economy depends upon, uh, even something like smartphone technology, which which most all of us either have or we want or we're struggling to have or we're struggling to upgrade. Um, the more you research, you know, something even like smartphone technology, you find that there are terrible ties to uh, this technology coming at a price and that price being child labor, uh, you know, uh, a childhood being spent in factory work. Um, making smartphone components uh, when that childhood could be spent doing things that we would want children to do instead rather than working uh, very long hours for little to, you know, very little pay. So I, I do think that these poems still fit in the world that we live in today. Uh, even if you take it outside of the uh, Industrial Revolution context, it's just kind of neat to see the duality of life that we have a voice of innocence, and then we do have that voice of experience that most often we think that voice of experience is going to be the one we should listen to. But I think a lot of Blake's poetry challenges that uh, and, and makes us wonder if that voice of innocence, if it's if we've lost it, how can we get that back? Because there are some fundamental comforting truths uh, that the Song of Innocence uh, the songs of innocence are able to give us. So I hope you like these two poems. Tell me what you think of them on the discussion board and I'll see your thoughts there. Thank you.